Thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. We're excited to have Liz Marshall as the guest for today's episode. Liz Marshall is an award-winning Canadian filmmaker. Since the 1990s, she's written, produced, directed, and filmed diverse international and socially conscious documentaries. Her work has been released theatrically, been broadcast globally, and made available digitally, and has screened for hundreds of grassroots community around the globe. Marshall's visionary feature-length films explore social justice and environmental themes driven by strong characters. Marshall's current feature documentary, Meet the Future, chronicles the birth of the clean, cultured, cell-based, cultivated meat industry in America through the eyes of pioneer Dr. Uma Valetti. Previous titles include Midian Farm, Water on the Table, and the HIV AIDS Trilogy for the Stephen Lewis Foundation, just to name a few. Liz, I'm excited to welcome you to the Cultured Beat and Future Food Show. Hi, Alex. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Liz, tell us a little bit about your background and your very exciting most recent project. Sure. Well, first of all, Meet the Future is an exclusive story about a a very big new idea that this podcast knows all about. And I feel and believe deeply that it offers hope to the world, especially right now in 2020 with all that we're facing. And as a filmmaker, it's important to me that I make a difference with my work in the world. So I've been making feature length documentaries uh, for a decade. And then prior to that, prior to making feature length documentaries, I spent a decade traveling the world, making films for broadcasters and for non-governmental organizations about some of the most pressing social justice issues of our times. I filmed in war zones and sweatshops across sub-Saharan Africa, uh, witnessing the HIV AIDS pandemic. And I was really, I felt a degree of helplessness um, at the magnitude of social and economic injustice and just had an awakening, I I feel, that as a privileged Canadian filmmaker, I can use my passion and skills for storytelling and the art form of documentary is a very powerful platform to reach a lot of people. And so I'll just sort of zoom ahead to my last feature length documentary, which is called The Ghosts in Our Machine. And it was released in 2013 and it's been seen on every continent uh, by hundreds of thousands of viewers across the globe. And it was a very effective social impact film about the billions of animals that are used uh, within industries. And uh, so food, entertainment, biomedical research, and fashion. I really, really wanted my my next film to be about a very big solution and f- for it to have an upbeat quality and to feature uh, pioneers. And so the light bulb went off for me right away when I, when I met Uma Valetti and his teeny tiny team back in uh, early 2016 at the Memphis Meets headquarters in the outskirts of Silicon Valley. And I realized that I really wanted this to be my next film. I wanted to follow the birth of the cell-based meat industry. Back then it was referred to as cultured meat, clean meat. The nomenclature actually is really interesting. I find. And, and so this, the journey began back in 2016 and it took three and a half years to make the film. And now here we are and we're releasing the film. And it's definitely a very smooth and beautiful transition from the ghosts in our machines to what meet the future kind of highlights as a technology. As a filmmaker, how does the process of selecting a new project really come to fruition? Like, I know you mentioned that you met with the Memphis Meats team at their office, but how was kind of, how did you originally get introduced? So I was introduced to the concept of clean meat through the media. I remember in 2013 when Mark Post's 
hamburger. Uh, I remember when that was unveiled and that was a, a big sort of media frenzy around that out of London, the UK. And I remember thinking immediately that that was fascinating and that this could go somewhere. But then when I, in two, 2016, early 2016, was when Memphis Meats unveiled the world's first clean meatball. And my friend Bruce Friedrich had already launched his Good Food Institute. And so I was in touch with him and talking with him about ways to potentially cover the story as it was unfolding. And he introduced me to, to Uma. And it, so the, the, the journey began in April 2016. Wow, that's awesome. So the film has traveled quite a bit to document the important events in this cultured meat or cultivated meat timeline. And I know this because on several occasions, you know, I would bump into the team myself. We would see them in either DC or or at the Good Food Conference, for example. How often was the team traveling to capture footage throughout the, the course of the project? And I know that there was actually, you know, part of the film is filmed in, in India. What were the experiences like when it comes to travel and filming? Yeah, so that's a great question because ideally we would have just been around the corner ready to jump at every twist and turn in, in the story, you know, sort of situated. That would have been the ideal <laughs> kind of situation, but of course... That's not possible, not only uh, from a budget perspective. You know, when you're following a story over three and a half years, it can be expensive. <laughs> and also, we're a Canadian production company. We're a Canadian team. So it was really a matter of being on the pulse, forging those important relationships, and staying tuned in to what was going on and trying to be ahead of the public news blast and be behind the scenes. So the concept for the film was really to be a witness to the personal motivation and the team and also the innovation and the unfolding of so many twists and turns. For example, I mean, the innovation of taste and texture and the unveiling of new products to the world, that's one aspect of the story. But then there's the whole historic aspect of fundraising and Uma rising in prominence as a CEO and securing historic funding investment from the meat industry and billionaire influencers and others around the globe. These were sort of story, story benchmarks that we could never have predicted. And it happened so quickly. So our task was to determine, okay, when do we need to jump on a plane and be in the field and be behind the scenes? And when can we allow the the media press cycle to just do its bit. And then we would kind of extract pieces from it for the film and try to capture the more personal angle. So, you know, you mentioned India and that was such an important part of the filmmaking was to follow Uma with his uh, wonderful life partner, his wife, Murnalini, to uh, Vijayawada, India, to visit family and... Why was that important? Well, because ultimately the film is about Uma Valetti as a protagonist, as an entry point into a big idea, to explore a big idea through a human lens is always more captivating and, and draws people in on a deeper level. So to humanize the story of science and food technology and and business and sort of this, for some, it's still a very novel, abstract concept. So to ground it in a human story is just so important in storytelling. So 
filming with Uma and, and getting to know him better and to understand his roots and what motivates him and what his path has been, I think really provides a, an emotional center to the, to the film that makes the film much more accessible. And then just quickly to answer your question about, you know, the crew and, and how you bumped into us along the way. We filmed a lot of different events. We tried to be there in Washington, D.C. at every historic. Actually, we were there from the food regulatory angle. We were in the field, whether it was at the FDA or the USDA. We were there on the ground with access, capturing those milestones. But, you know, when you make a feature documentary over three and a half years, it's not necessarily scripted. You have to follow the story organically. And so we have a lot of material, over 200 hours of, of material. And of course, the film is 90 minutes. And then there's a 78 minute version. And that's the version that will be premiering in Canada on May 7th on television. So it really is such a incredible process to determine, okay, you know, we have all this great material, but then how do you make sense of it to make the most concise edited story? I want to ask about perception of this technology over the last three and a half years. You know, have you noticed that the number of people that are familiar with cell cultured meat or cell based meat, and we mentioned the nomenclature earlier and how that's a very dynamic aspect of it, but have you noticed the number of people that are familiar with the technology has increased? Absolutely. And I think that's one of the most exciting aspects for me as a filmmaker because in and I can sort of even just from my own my own perspective I can talk about that a little bit which is when I was pitching this in 2016 and 2017 to get financed for a film the response was very well it was challenging really challenging because it was just so novel and people I don't think really understood the significance or perhaps they were they they felt that it was risky to get to get behind it i'm not sure but now it's just a big topic that more and more and more people are talking about and so what i find fascinating is that it happened so quickly the conversation and the acceleration and you see that from different angles. You see it on the food regulatory front. That happened and is continuing to happen very, very quickly. You see it globally in terms of how many startups are popping up around the globe. You see it in the media. And you see it from the ability to be financed. So for example, just this past February, 2020, Memphis Meats announced 161 million investment in the company, which is astounding. Now that didn't make it to the film because we'd already completed the film, but it just goes to show that they continue to be a leader pushing the needle forward. And I think also people at large and also the film industry, everyone, is, is becoming much more aware and, and awakened to the significance of this topic and the timeliness of it. So I would say that's in some ways the most exciting aspect of releasing the film now. And back in 2016, there was just no way of predicting how quickly this would become a mainstream issue. From a viewer perspective, and knowing that they announced that $161 million raise, the end of the film gave me, because, you know, at the end of the film where you see like Memphis Meets is expanding or maybe the team is, is getting together as the film closes out. It's interesting you said that, you know, that all happened before the announcement because the way it was framed was a very nice and satisfying, as for a viewer, it was very satisfying to to kind of see almost as if it was like the result of, 
okay, now they've raised this, this amount of money, they're expanding, and now we're going to see what the next steps are. So it's interesting that it happened before, but it, it ended in a very satisfying way, uh, knowing that they, they raised that money. So that's very interesting, actually, from a personal perspective. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. And I'm, I'm happy it's translating that way for people because it needed to be an open-ended conclusion. It's not really a conclusion. It's more of a sort of the, the film ends on a note that allows you to understand and see that this is, the momentum is there and that this little teeny tiny company is now a force to be reckoned with and, and to, you know, keep your, keep your eyes out for news that will continue to come. So I'm, I'm glad that we got that final story beat, which was last fall, 2019. Yeah, so I was, I was really happy with that final scene as well. What are some of the challenges when creating a documentary in general? And what challenges are unique to Meet the Future? Or what challenges were unique to this project specifically? <laughs> There's lots of challenges. You know, I would say... The first challenge is being financed. We're lucky here in Canada because we do have broadcasters that commission. So the Documentary Channel is a wonderful is a wonderful platform. They also commissioned my last film, The Ghosts in Our Machine. So they really championed Meet the Future early on. And I'm so grateful for that support. We also have some public pots of money and then so financing is it takes time. It's it's not usually a one-stop shop like I mean if it had been a Netflix original for example, all the financing would come from that source. But so getting financed for a feature doc that takes three and a half years to make is um can be a challenge for sure. And then there's other challenges that are story related or access uh related along the way. And Keep in mind that when you're making a film, there's just 100,000 details and decisions to be made every step of the way. So there's a lot of minutia, a lot of... Um, so having a solid team is so essential. And uh, I love the team. We're a strong team. You know, we work well together. And and you need that. You need that support. And as the writer, director, producer that's out front, I could never, I can't do this work without having a solid team, you know? So on the creative side, on the financial side, like you just need to feel and be supported and have a good sounding board and, and, and teamwork along the way. So that's essential. And then I would say from a story perspective, well, my job is to always make sure that we have access, whether it's to uh, the development facility at Memphis Meets, <laughs> or whether it's to the United States Department of Agriculture, or whether it's to the Good Food Institute. These people, these spaces and places reveal story and give us images and give us content and substance uh, required to weave together a complex narrative. And that can be challenging, especially when you're talking about the birth of an industry and a birth of an industry re requires a lot of trial and error, development, research, and intellectual property. So I forged really strong, unique access agreements early on and then, of course, the relationships are essential. Like, you can't make a character-driven documentary without having strong relationships. And so I, I feel really happy about the fact that uh, our relationship with Memphis Meets and everyone in the film is just so solid. There was a really great give and take and, and negotiation process along the way. Our needs... Sometimes I wanted a lot more than I could get, 
but that's just me doing my job and that's them doing their job to say, well, actually we can't show the world this because it's, it's proprietary, but you know, we did film a lot of proprietary stuff and there's, there's a lot of proprietary stuff in the film that made it to the film that is fascinating and unprecedented. So just to wrap up this answer, I would say, Meet the Future is an exclusive story coming at the right time in our human evolution at a time where we need transformation, we need solutions. And this is a unique access behind the scenes story of a company, a CEO, a movement that provided access to this little Canadian team over time at the genesis phase of the birth of an industry. And so I think it's a really unique pro project. And, and of course, it's exhausting, yeah, to make it and to do it, but so rewarding. That's a long-winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> but a good answer, a great answer. So film documents people having firsthand experiences trying the cultured meat product from Memphis Meats. Have you or your team members been able to try it as well? Yes. So first, let me say that um, I was really looking forward to trying it. And with zero sort of conflict of, of within, my, within my own conscience, because I, I don't eat meat. And I, I decided not to eat meat 30 years ago and for ethical reasons. And that's a, a daily form of activism that I practice that is right for me. It's, I feel morally aligned with that decision. Now, when I wanted to try this meat, it's because I don't have any ethical dilemma in, in, in trying it. And it was a, it was a incredibly strange experience because on the visceral level as human animals, I think that our memory of meat is sort of, greater and, and, and uh, spans a greater, like it's in your DNA or something. It's part of your, I think, human experience. Meat is a, uh, has been a chief staple of civilization for millennia. And so it was so familiar to my palate, to my taste buds, to my, to the experience of chewing it and swallowing it and tasting it. And it, Honestly, I'm not the best person to ask whether it tastes identical to meat because I don't eat meat. But in my experience of trying it, I tried the poultry twice. And at different time intervals, I tried it. It's exactly what I remember meat to be. Exactly. And so it blew my mind, even though I'd been covering the story and I understood that this is real meat. It, there, there's no difference. At the cellular level, it's identical. It still blew my mind. And I said, That's, that tastes like meat or something stupid. I said something like that. <laughs> and we all laughed and they said, because it is meat. And I said, yes, yes, of course, of course it, it is meat. But just having my own experience with it was a really interesting experiential thing. And I have a hoodie and on the back of the hoodie, it says first bite. <laughs> and so I'm one of those people, those, you know, tiny little pool of people in the world that has tried something that is so innovative and so forward thinking. You know, I feel privileged to be part of that little, that little group. Have you tried it? I have not tried Memphis meats, but I have tried very, very tiny samples at some other companies. And I think, you know, when we look at all of the startups in this space, the Memphis meets tastings that we see in the media or through the photos are the ones that I think everyone aspires to, to have that level of, I guess, not just volume, but quality and presentation. Yeah, yeah, they're very meticulous, laser focused people. I, I've learned a lot from them actually, just around, you know, I think Uma is a great leader. I really do. He's a, he's a gentle, thoughtful, intelligent man. And he really looks to his team, learns from his team, respects his team. 
and uh, I think he really models excellent leadership. And it's been a privilege to feature an individual who has risen in prominence and will basically go down in history as a pioneer. My next question was about how it is like to work with Uma, but maybe I could expand the question to how is it like to interface with the rest of the Memphis Meets team? And I say this because you know we've had very special interactions with the team uh, anytime we've had interactions with them, specifically Eric and, and David. So what was it like to work with Maybe not specifically Uma, but the rest of the Memphis Meets team. You know, they're fun. They're a smart, positive group of individuals that want to change the world and and that are really dedicated, committed. Because I had the experience of popping in there so many times, I felt that we became part of the family. And it was a warm kind of greeting every time. And, and eventually they really got used to us. And, and what I mean by that is at first, I think they were quite sort of camera shy and not really understanding that ultimately I didn't want them to be performative, stylized for the camera. I wanted them to kind of forget about us, ignore us completely, go about their daily business, their day-to-day -day operations, and that we're there as a fly on the wall to be very observational. And that, of course, I was pulling people aside and doing interviews along the way. And we were getting some stylized, sort of more controlled shots of, you know, using a macro lens, for example, when we needed to film the science and technology. That was important to take a much more considered stylized approach with some of that material. But for the most part, it's a human story and being being witness to the growth of a, of a startup is um, was my motivation. And so eventually they really understood that. And it was such a pleasure to pop in at certain points and they're like, hey, you know, and there's that greeting. But it's like we were just so comfortable to be a fly on the wall and then eat lunch together and uh I think we really just got to know each other and the trust was there, which is huge. In fact, the trust is everything. And uh, so I would say, you know, I learned so much about their world and I think they learned so much about our world. And, and I think that was a, a, a really important relationship. So Hot Docs is now scheduled uh, to air through and air at home experience in Canada through CBC, CBC Gem, and the documentary channel on May 7th. Uh, and that's all in Canada. What does it feel like now that the project is about to touch a wider audience? <laughs> yes, it's called Hot Docs at Home. So, and that's on CBC, which is our national, amazing, huge broadcast platform and documentary channel and gem which is online so those are all cbc affiliate affiliates and then hot docs is north america's largest documentary film festival so it's it's really i feel like wow this is uh the best possible outcome right now during this covid19 time that we're in when everything has changed for the release of a film in terms of looking at a trajectory of a film where you rely on people coming together in theaters. I mean, we were planning a whole theatrical release across the country. So uh, we're just really stoked. I think this is exciting. I think there'll be a lot of people that watch it. So the exposure is fantastic. And, and that is what, that is why you make a film is you want the exposure. You want the exposure because you want the film to reach as many people as possible. So I think we have a, a real maximum opportunity here in this country, in Canada. And in terms of, uh, and we were also, by the way, chosen, we're an official selection of, of the Hot Docs Film Festival as a special presentation film which is a huge honor. It feels like a silver platter 
<laughs> and then there's a lot of media, a lot of press around the film right now. I'm just starting to do interviews. This is my first um, podcast. And then news about other screenings outside of Canada are coming soon. The only thing I can announce right now is the New Zealand Dock Edge Oscar qualifying film festival, which is a really awesome film festival. I love those guys. They, they screened The Ghosts in Our Machine as well back in, I believe, 2014. And that will be this spring. Aside from that, there's nothing that I can officially announce yet. But believe me, there's going to be lots of news along the way, including news about distributors and, and distribution, I should say, and uh, things like that. So I can't, I can't talk about it yet because it's in the works. But um, I hope people can be patient and uh, the ways that people can tune in is to our social media channels and to our website and and follow and engage and, and be part of the conversation. Great. And that is www.meetthefuture.com. And that's with M-E-A-T. Uh, and so any updates for uh, future releases will be uh, posted there. Is that yep. right? Correct. Great. Yes. Liz, this has been Really amazing. Do you have any last insights for our listeners today? I do. I think from an issue perspective, I'd just like to say that from a climate emergency perspective and from a health pandemic perspective, I think that the birth of this industry and the, the unveiling of, of this film at this time is just so timely and important and critical. And so... I encourage listeners, audiences everywhere to learn more about alternatives and this, this topic, not, not just the science, technology, and business side of this innovation, but the, the social issues that are underpinning this film. And that's really the moral motivation behind why I made the film and also I believe it's what morally motivates so many people that are innovating cell-based meat. So I think, I think it's really coming at the right time and timeliness is everything. And, and so here we go. Liz, thank you so much for being with us today on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. It's so great to talk to you, Alex. Thank you. This is your host, Alex, and we look forward to being with you on our next episode. 